Okay, uh, happy to introduce our speaker, Carl Kesselman. He's going to talk to us about you learned what. He'll explain that. He's the director of ISI's Information Science Research Division. He's also a ISI fellow, its highest honor. Uh, he's won a number of awards, the Lovelace uh, Medal from the British Computer Society, fellow of the British Computer Society and Association for Computing, and uh, got his uh, PhD from UCLA, and he's been at ISI since 97. Thank you, Mike. All right. So, um, good. Let's get rolling here. So, I'm going to. Uh, did you want this slide? Coming events. All right. So, don't worry about that. We're going to skip over. We've heard all this stuff already. No questions. All right. So, we're going to spend today, we're going to talk mostly about data. Uh, I'm going to start with this quote that Yagal insists is produced by chat GPT, but I thought I like this quote, so we're going to use it. And this is, if you're not familiar, this is Mark Twain. So he wrote Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and was known for being quite a caustic and cynical individual um, in his lifetime. So I'm going to hopefully continue in the spirit of Mark Twain and being uh, cynical and biting. So he said, data is like garbage. You better know what you're going to do with it before you collect it. And kind of the theme for the talk today is let's not create garbage and are we creating garbage and who's going to take care of it so that's kind of the overall conversation we're going to have today and by the way so um feel free just if you have questions just shout them out um we can make this informal so here's a general outline of what we're going to do i'm going to start by ranting and pounding the table for a few minutes then i'm going to have some high level highfalutin philosophy we're going to talk about in the philosophy of science and what it means to have data we're going to talk about some system stuff how do we uh, build some computing systems? Now I'm going to have some solutions. We're going to talk about, I'm going to present a use case that we've actually been involved with, and then we're all going to have lunch. So that's the plan. Okay, um, acknowledgements. There's lots of people who've been uh, involved in helping this out. Uh, these five students here, raise your hand. Uh, the, these students have all been involved in some of the work I'm going to describe. They were working over the weekend. Uh, some people in my group, Mike Bazzani, um, Rob Schuler, who's sitting back there. I've stolen some of his slides. And seeing as this is an a AI research for health, Ben Zhu is in um, the uh, uh, Department of Ophthalmology here in Cat. So that's kind of uh, people. So anything you hear that you find uh, extremely insulting uh, or, or makes you mad, that will be my fault. And all the good stuff will be uh, from these people here. All right. So I'm going to start. Um, well, this is a little philosophy. And then, then we'll get into the ranting. So why do we do machine learning? What is the point here? What are we trying to accomplish in this center? Right? And there's two ways we can look at this. One is, well, we're really interested in developing fundamental new algorithms for AI and machine learning, and we want to invent the next sophisticated deep learning algorithm, and that's our goal. You know, that's what we want to do. Um, on the other hand, we could be engaged in this because we want to solve problems. There's a real world problem. There's a problem associated with health and we want to solve that problem. So ultimately our goal here is about solving, my perspective is our goal here is about solving problems in health and impacting health and societal benefit and not so much in developing a fancy computer algorithm, right? So if our goal is to solve problems then ultimately we want to know is our solution better, right? First of all, is our solution right, right? We don't, wanna, we don't wanna prescribe a diagnosis that's wrong. And is it better? These are in some sense fundamental questions that we see um, that shows up when we developed new interventions for health, right? And, and similarly, when we wanna view developing new solutions in health is fundamentally an experimental process. What's a clinical trial? I have a hypothesis, right? I wanna test that hypothesis and I do that by generating data, coming up with red controlled studies, doing evaluations, doing all my biostats, all that stuff, right? We can view the development of AI algorithms and machine learning algorithms to create interventions and help as being very much an experimental scientific process, just like any other aspect of health. So that's the first thing. And maybe I'm gonna be saying a lot of stuff that's super obvious to everyone. It's like, well, move on. I know all this already, but we should be viewing what we're doing, not as writing, code, right, and running programs, but conducting experiments in a scientific way, right? And if we want to conduct experiments that are valid, 
We know how to do that is called the scientific method. So we should take what we know from the scientific method and apply it to the development of AI methods and algorithms to provide solutions in health, right? And so the fundamental notion of the scientific method is we wanna pose, pose a question, we're gonna have a hypothesis, we wanna test that with an experiment, we wanna analyze the data, we wanna report and share the conclusions and repeat until we're done, right? So that's how we should be thinking about our AI algorithm rhythm and development of solutions to AI research and health is towards we need to conduct experiments and we need to have a valid scientific methodology in which to perform those, you know, conducting those experiments. So that's kind of observation number one. So now we can kind of hand wave about philosophy because we've been thinking about what does it mean to have a scientific result and do an experiment for a couple of centuries now, right? So I'm going to say that, first of all, to have a meaningful scientific result, others need to know about it. Right, so we have to have this result and somehow we need to share that in a way that people are gonna believe you. And what that means is that the other individuals who you're sharing this result with are gonna to have to at some level validate that, right? So they're gonna to have to say, do I believe you, yes or no? And we can talk about validation in several levels. We need to be able to re reproduce the result. Uh, in general, um, we need to be able to reproduce the method, right, and get the same result. We need to achieve the same result with a different method potentially. And we need to, if we've learned something, we wanna take that knowledge that we've acquired and possibly apply that to development of a new method. And here's a, a nice quote from an English um, philosopher, which says, non-reproducible single occurrences are of no significance to science, right? The quality of that is, a program that you run by yourself on your laptop is meaningless. Right, unless you contextualize it in these other aspects that turn that into actual scientific knowledge. So that's the perspective we have to take here. So how are we doing? All right, well, the short answer is not very well. So there'd be dragons. So let's look at some dragons. 1922, sloppy use of machine learning is causing reproducibility crisis in science. I don't know about you, but I would rather not be associated with any discipline in which the word crisis is applied, right? So I'm just pulling some stuff from the popular literature. I'm gonna come, data leakage causes reproducibility failures in ML-based science, right? Autocorrect errors in Excel still generate genomics headaches. I think I have one more here. No, yeah. So if we look in the literature, what we see is if we view and developing machine learning solutions as science, again, I'm gonna be the Mark Twain here, we're not doing a very good job. All right, so let's look at some specific things just to highlight this point. So this was a former colleague of Mike's at Riverside, and he's done an interesting thing where he's looked at kind of um, time series anomaly detection. And he's gone back and he's analyzed a bunch of papers. This is a, a fairly dramatic statement. We are not aware of a single paper that represents forceful reproducible evidence that deep learning outperforms much simpler methods. That's a pretty damning statement, right? They, many recent papers seem to pose the research question as it is obvious that deep learning is the answer, right? Yet, if he now analyzes the results, the answer is no. And said, so, well, I would never be caught doing that. Well, sorry folks, this appeared in the USC report. Really complicated problem, answer. We know what the answer is, right? So th this cartoon, right? I think there should be more explicit in step two than a miracle occurs, right? So, so we've got some problems. Let's look at another example. There's a great group of people at Princeton We've looked at another class of machine learning algorithms and kind of analyzed them in terms of reproducibility. And what they found in a significant number of cases, there were errors in the result. The results were not as strong or wrong, right? And the reason why they were not as strong or wrong was because of basic data management errors. For example, they mixed the training and evaluation data together. But how, how could you do that? Well, I'm gonna show you how you can do that in my example. They used, you know, they filled in missing values. Well, I would never have a missing value. I'll show you, you do, right? And they basically confounded the data when they imputed missing things. They had proxy variables, right? You're doing feature extraction, right? You have proxy variables that had data linkage. They had um, cross-validation, right? So basically what happened is, 
from this analysis of like 30 papers, they found errors due to basic data management and dirty data that invalidated the results of all these papers. And here's just a bit of a summary, right? So across the board, but neuropsychiatry, medicine, radiology, all these things, and they enumerated. It's a wonderful, they have a website, it's called Reproducible or something like that. So it's a great website, right? And they kind of keep track of all this stuff that's going on. And uh, Iman's website is also, Iman, did I say that right? Emin, yeah, his website is great too, right? So um, again, I'm painting a rather dramatic picture here, but I think there's, a, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. I think there's enough stuff here to indicate maybe we should be a little more careful, right? And I know we're concerned about bias. I know we're concerned about fairness. I know we're concerned about all these things when we talk about AI and ethics and so on. But these are not those problems. These are problems that result from basic mismanagement and fundamental errors in the data, not any of the fancy stuff we care, we care about, right? So this should make us concerned, especially if we're trying to apply AI to issues of health, right? We don't wanna, what's the, uh, there another just fact, right? So they did this study, there was this group, they went and they looked at trying and reproduce the results from cancer papers, right? I think the answer was like only 20% of the published results, right, were reproducible, right? You don't want to have a paper, right, that you published in a high venue journal that has to be retracted because you made a data error, right? And we look and see in the literature papers that are being retracted. That's bad for all of us. So you don't want to be in that position. So what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Was this restricted to machine learning uh, yeah, papers that use machine? Because yes. it's a well-known problem in general. Yeah, yeah, right. So, right, we all have dirty laundry here. It's a general. Pro it's a problem in general. Um, these were restricted to machine learning. You know, I would state um, the problem might be a little more exacerbated. I mean, there is recognition in the machine learning community that this is a problem. I think part of the issue also is there's a lot of froth. Right, and it's like, oh, AI is going to solve all our problems, right? So that slide from the USC Precision Medicine report—that's where it came from, right? You know, I was so, just asking yeah. because, as I'm sure you know, right, uh, there are lots of problems in how people select the data that they're absolutely, using, and that happens in other absolutely. areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's not just it's not just our problem; it's a general problem. But there's so much focus and attention, and there's certain aspects of our problem that I think make it unique. Right, so you know, I think the fundamental thing is looking in the mirror, saying, "I am running an experiment." Right, I need to behave like a scientist. Um, what does that mean? Right, I think if you're doing science, if you're in a lab and you got test tubes and stuff like that, it's a little easier to think you're a scientist. You got a lab coat on and gloves. Right, we, we don't show up in the morning, put a lab coat on, so we maybe don't think we're a scientist. But you know, the part of the point is here. Yeah, it's a problem, and we're doing science, so we need to have some notion of what is our scientific method and what is our experimental methodology, and let's be explicit about that. And I think there's a tendency not to do that. And I'll and and so that's kind of the special thing about what we have in machine learning and AI algorithms. So and I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that momentarily. So, you know, in general, I think, so now I'm going to start to my table pounding. And actually, you know, to your point is that kind of a common thread that we see across these examples is that there's this core issue of reproducibility, right? If I can't document and understand what I've done well enough to reproduce it from day to day and do real validation and comparisons, then I don't have science here, right? And because we want to compare between models, we want to compare between AI methods and best practice, you know, non-AI methods, we want to compare between alternative methods, right? And we need to validate correctness. Right, and so this is all kind of tied into reproducibility. Now, my thesis is part of the problem is, as I was getting earlier, we were so excited about writing algorithms and code, we've forgotten the fact that the data is actually super important and maybe the hardest part, right, in a number of these things. And so what I'm kind of gonna advocate here is that we need to shift our perspective and focus less on the, I'm, not, I'm being deliberately obnoxious here, but we should focus less on the code and the models and we should focus more on the data, right? Because if we don't pay attention to that, it doesn't matter how fancy your algorithm is, you'll get the wrong answer, right? So that's kind of my underlying thesis. 
then which brings us to this idea we need to flip the paradigm we all think about and i know we all do we think about workflows we think about code we think about i'm going to run this program and then this program and then this program right that is a code centric or our, our flow centric digital universe. And what I advocate is we need to flip the paradigm and we need to have a data centric view where what we're, because data is the knowledge. And what we need to do is capture and go from understood data to understood data. And yeah, there's some code that links us together, but it, the knowledge capture is basically about creating and publishing collections of data. And there's, there's been, you know, over time, a number of people who have looked at this problem. So there's a wonderful book that was done by a, a philosopher of science called uh, Sabino Lionel, called A Data-Centric Biology. It's a very nice, well, a little bit philosophical read, but she talks about the transition of biology to being data-centric and the role of data playing in understanding biology. Um, and then in the kind of computer science, system science realm, so we've been doing a lot of work in, in, in my division, Rob and Alejandro and other people on data-centric discovery. So this idea, how do we do discovery? And then it turns out in the enterprise business space, there's been a, a number of work done. IBM did some interesting things in data-centric workflows. Um, Dennis Gannon and Beth uh, Plath, I think I spelled her name wrong, who's currently at NSF, did some work on data-centric scientific workflows. So it's really flipping the paradigm. I don't care about the computing. What I care about is the data, which is the endpoints of that. So let's think a little bit about you know how do we go about creating a data centric approach so we're going to so what that means is we're going to focus on characterization and management of data and not a model and with the idea that now we can switch to a regime where we have a very well defined set of training data which we know is clean and a well defined set of features which we know don't pollute our data we will run some well defined set of code on it we produce an answer and we know exactly what that is so that's kind of the data centric philosophy here all right so I'm also not the only one who's come up with this idea. It's very interesting. There's a nice presentation that was done by some engineers at Google, actually looking at data back at retinopathy. Uh, we're going to look at actually very similar data to what these Google people looked at. And they talk about how do you create ML, right? Create the algorithms in my lab or in the engineering and deploy it as a production facility, right? And kind of the conclusion that these folks came up with is, Again, similar thing. Everyone is focused here and here, but if these things don't work, the data parts, everything breaks. And that's what they observed in practice. So having the right data is crucial for model quality. Preparing it for the ML pipeline takes effort and care, a lot of effort and care. And I'll give you an example momentarily. An invalid data can cause production outputs, right? So data monitoring, validation, and fixing are essential integral parts of the process. And so this is the reference to that, that tutorial. It's a very nice uh, summary. And again, taking this data-centric perspective, data perspective. So it's like 40 slides about nothing but data management for building production ML pipelines. All right, so now let's shift and talk a little bit about data. So it turns out, if you live in the data sharing community, in the last couple of years, there's been an uptake of a way of characterizing data to make it useful. So if you go into the digital libraries community, the repository community, the data sharing community, we come up, actually we didn't, I didn't, with this notion of data should be what's called fair, which it should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now, if you happen to be submitting an NIH proposal, right? And you see now there's a data sharing requirement that you have to document. And if you look at the various NIH websites, you'll see this fair stuff showing up again and again and again. So this is becoming prevalent. It's really big in Europe. They're going crazy on this stuff. And at the in the agencies, both NSF and NIH, we're seeing a big push towards fair data production. And there's some kind of technical things from a library science perspective or what this means. So we have to have unique identifiers. We have to have metadata that describes it. That makes it findable. Accessible means we have to have standard protocols with access control and it, the data needs to be accessible the metadata needs to be accessible even if the data isn't we need to be, have standardized terms to describe the data that makes it interoperable and we have to act, have accurate and re relevant attributes that are up to date with what we're doing to make it reusable so yeah so so do, i mean with the fair data system that came initially had this old semantic web kind of connotations about the what it really meant to be a uh, unique identifier, it was like a URL and yeah. a URI. 
Do they, but most people don't, don't mean it really in that no. uh, narrow technical. No. So is that you see very little semantic web. So there's a question when you start doing metadata descriptions, you know, we can talk in length about semantic web. You'll see some JSON LD, right? What you'll see is, um, as I'll show you more materially, we meet all these requirements without any semantic web. And we're actually very deliberate about not using semantic web technology because ultimately when we look at the whole ecosystem of producer and consumer, if you go to a biologist and show them some RDF, they'll just walk out the door. So, so we're really looking at how do you, because we go back to scientific science is about capturing, exchanging knowledge. Data represents the knowledge. We're in medicine and computer science, medicine and AI. If we don't have a way of communicating with the domain scientists, all help, hope is lost, right? And so what we see in practice, not so much in semantic web, we see some JSON LD. We see, you know, some of that stuff is there, but it's not a requirement, I would say. Yeah, when you were saying that in Europe people are going crazy, I was wondering what they were actually. Yeah, doing. they're doing that. And, you know, we're also seeing in the NI in the NIH space, they're they're like we're in the middle of writing a big proposal right now. They're they're bifurcating between the idea of a data portal and a knowledge portal, right? So data portal. So how do you actually capture and find the data artifacts? And then looking at more detailed semantic descriptions of that data. And so you're seeing a lot of knowledge graph show, stuff show up kind of to represent that. One of the questions in my mind is, what are the connections between representing the data in a, in a reasonable way? And how does that connect to the knowledge graph? Anyway, longer, longer conversation, but good question. So this is not predicated on a semantic web. So fair data. So that's kind of that's kind of coming up, you know, we see that frequently. Now, let's go back to the notion of, okay, fair data sounds good, I'm all for it. So let's now think a little bit about what it means to do science. And there's this great quote here from Richard Feynman, who you might know as a physicist, won the Nobel Prize, was at Caltech for many, many years. And he gave a nice, uh, you can find this, he gave a commencement lecture at Caltech and he talks about um, the American oil drop experiment and why it took so long to actually get the correct charge on the electron. And it's basically because people were cherry picking their data. They say, ah, oh, this drop doesn't count. Um, so he goes, I'm not going to read this. But basically, he says, if you don't capture and share all of your data, all of it, the failed experiments, the good experiments, the stuff you threw out because it's obviously wrong, you're not doing good science. So he says, um, you should report everything that you think might make it invalid, not only what you think is right about it, right? So, so we're gonna connect the dots here, right? So, uh, and then, so, so that's the idea. So now let's combine those two ideas, right? So one is, we'll accept the idea that fair is good, Right, it's a good idea. Data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we need to have all of our data, even the stuff that's that's obviously crap. So how do we combine those two ideas? Well, so that's something we've been working on now for quite a, quite some time. So we can solve that. We can kind of connect those two ideas together by saying, let's just make all of our data fair. Let's not say, oh, I'm getting this ready for publication. It's on my laptop. It doesn't really matter. Nobody else is going to see it. It's broken. I have a mistake in my code, right? Quit making excuses. All of your data is fair all the time. You're always sharing data, whether it's with your advisor, or with your colleague, or with yourself, right? And that is now a constant state. And if we have, and this is something that we've called continuous fairness, right? And if we have a methodology in which all the data that we generate is fair, then we meet Feynman's criteria, right? And now we're starting to do science. So, and we've written a paper about this, which is called How Continuous and Ubiquitous Fairness Can Enhance Research Productivity. Um, and I kind of go through this in detail. I'm not going to go through that now. So that's the idea. So let's come up with a structure in which everything is fair. And if we do that, then we're starting to do science. So what we end up doing is having this kind of continuous cycle. So we go back to the earlier picture on the scientific method, where now we're centered on the data, data centric. It's in the middle. And what we're doing is we're taking that data. We're using it for modeling. We're using it for validation. We're using it for dissemination at all kinds of scales. We're going round and round and round, right? And we're fair all the time. So that's the idea. 
Um, now, this is not just a technical problem, but it's, it's what we call a social technical problem, because what we need to do is introduce the ideas of fairness into your daily practice. So every day when you get up, you're never generating any unfair data. So that's a combination of giving you the right tools and attitude adjustment. So we're going to talk about that momentarily. All right. And so from the tools perspective, what we've spent the last several years working on is a system that we call Deriva, which is basically meant to support the continuous creation and curation of fair data. So we kind of have these loops where we acquire, annotate, organize, share, derive, repeat until you're done and you're never done, right? And the idea, this is Rob's slide, thank you, Rob, is that we want to replace what nobody what nobody in this room is doing is just having arbitrary directories on Google Drive and maybe a spreadsheet, right? We would never do that, right? Replace that with meaningful, well-formed relational descriptions of the data and models, right? And have that adapt because it's continuous fairness so that it adapts to the change of our problems every day, right? And we build a platform we call Deriva to do that. This is like days of lecture, so we're not gonna go into that. You'll just have to trust me, we spent a lot of time figuring this out. And we've applied this at many levels of scale. So this is the platform that supports data sharing for the National Institute of Dental and Cranial Facial Research, the face space. Uh, this supports um, NIDDK for kidney uh, development and developmental biology. We've used this for basic neuroscience. We've used this to organize all the data from the common fund. We have like 6 million data objects under management with this platform. So this is a general reusable systems engineering approach, but we're gonna talk about how we apply this now specifically to machine learning. Um, so one way to think about this platform and a good analogy is if you think about it, if we, when you go and you take pictures on your camera, right, many people in this room are probably too young to remember when digital cameras first came out, you got a card, right? You took the card out of your camera, you plugged it into your PC, and you got a directory right, filled with stuff that had file names that maybe had the date, then the sequence number, January 1st, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, dot JPEG, right? And that was how you managed your pictures. And you had 10,000 pictures, you had no idea what you had, right? And then of course, now we have all these photo managers and music managers. We did the same thing with the records, right? You had blah, 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 you know, you'd come up with a fancy file name dot, dot MP4, MP3, and that's how you organized your, your albums. We don't do that anymore. We have systems, that understand the structure of what does it mean to have a photo algorithm album, right? How do I get it from the camera? How do I organize it by place, by person, by event? How do I create albums? How do I share those al albums? So kind of the analogy that we want to have is the equivalent of a, of a photo manager for scientific or machine learning data, right? But the problems change. So we can't just say, oh, here, use, here, use Apple Photo, because the model, the type of the things we want to represent are going to change, and it's science. We don't know exactly what we're doing, right? So we need to adapt and change over the day. So one of the big things we've done is we spent a lot of time thinking about how the systems adapt over time. So, and, and so Deriva promotes fair data production and integrates this into your daily workflow by basically supporting rich metadata, access control, standard interfaces, separation of the data objects from the description. So all the things we talked about, I'm not gonna go into that. Now, one of the key, Jose, leads to, to your point is one of the things that we've done in, in our development has been very explicit about the idea you need to describe your data. And in our case, we actually did look at graph models initially and decided not to use that. We, we, so what we use is entity relationship modeling. And those of you who know database stuff will know what that means. But basically, we're going to model the problem domain as a set of linked spreadsheets or tables, because we thought scientists kind of understand tables. Biologists, graphs, not so much. Now, what we unfortunately learned is Biologists just don't understand tables either. They understand 2D tables. They don't understand, once you have 3D table, you know, uh, they don't know, know what a matrix is, unfortunately. But so the basic approach we take is we have small models. I didn't get that. Oh, stop Could it. you try again? <laughs> we have small models where we're explicit about the structure of the data that evolve over time. 
From these models, we derive on the fly data entry and user interfaces for managing and manipulating that data based on common things that scientists know, which are kind of spreadsheety kinds of things. And that also gives us a platform to do automated quality control, data validation, things like that. So that's the basic underlying approach. So the key to this then is coming up with a minimal model that describes the structure of the data, but we're explicit about that. And so for that, we use something called entity relationship modeling. Um, and uh, if, you, if you've taken a database class, you know what that means. If you haven't taken a database class, you should learn what this means, right? And it's really important uh, that what this does is two things. It allows us to standardize around things like vocabulary and structure. Right? And it also turns out to be a really valuable tool for communicating across disciplines. Here's right? what I found. Stop it. So rather than being hand wavy and looking at a spreadsheet with 50,000 columns in it, we have a very concise graphical representation, which we can write on the whiteboard. And I can argue with the biologist or the, or the doctor as to what should go where and what this means, right? So this turns out to be a very important tool, not only for allowing us to build management platforms from a computer science perspective, but communication, capturing communication of knowledge across disciplines, right? And that might even be more important, right? So the idea is I can draw some boxes and arrows and I can sit down and explain to a doctor maybe what this means, in, in 30 minutes, and I can start having a, a meaningful, concrete conversation about what I'm doing. And in the absence of that, you have no idea what you're talking about. So, um, and, and this goes then to this point that now that I have an explicit representation of data, and I'm talking about the data, now I can do science, because the way science is done is by communities getting together, saying, here's my data, I don't believe you, arguing as to whether it's right or wrong, and then proposing a new hypothesis, a new experiment. And this notion of community, especially in the context of the center, is really important. We're not just communicating with, even across, you know, within, we're not just communicating with people who develop ML algorithms. We're communicating with people who do ML algorithms to the data generators, to the patient, to the doctors, to, and there's lots of different types of doctors, right? So this notion of capturing in a structured, easy to communicate way is super important if I wanna actually build a result that's correct. So, and we wanna be explicit about that. All right, so that's it. I think I'm in good shape. Now, let's see how we pull this all together. And I'm gonna walk through a real world example, right? You got the people in this corner work, uh, the room work all weekend on. Um, so we're gonna actually show you how this works. So here's a problem. So um, it turns out standard of care for if you have diabetes, which is a lot of people have diabetes, one of the, one of the core morbid morbidities is something called diabetic retinopathy. So the blood vessels in your eye kind of rupture and you go blind. And so standard of care is you go and you get, they, you show up and they have a camera and they point at your eye and they just take a picture of your retina. Right? It's called a fundus camera. So it turns out that, and this is what that looks like. It turns out that based on this, you can also make a reasonably good guess. An ophthalmologist can make a good guess by looking at this picture as to whether you have glaucoma, which is uh, increased ocular, intraocular uh, pressure of the fluid, right? And you can do this by basically pulling out this, uh, hopefully I'll get this right, pulling out the spot and looking at kind of the size of this, uh, kind of the inside and the outside of that, you look at the ratio of those sizes, and depending on if you're above some threshold, you might have glaucoma. So that's the problem. So, so can we develop, and, and right now it has to be done, an ophthalmologist has to look at all these things, and it's very expensive and efficient. So can we develop an ML algorithm that will replace, um, in a reasonable way, the ophthalmologist looking at the eye images and say, yeah, you have glaucoma, you should come in, I'm going to give you a real test. So that's the goal. All right, sounds good. And what we want to do is then develop an algorithm that will take a bunch of images, run it through this, uh, actually, which we've classified as by the ophthalmologist is you may have glaucoma, you don't have glaucoma, run it through some fancy fancy machine learning algorithm that uh, Maya can truly develop and come up with a yes or no, right? Do you, and then of course you give it a random image and away you go. All right, sounds good enough. So let's look at what happens in practice, right? I'm not. Um, I'm going to be very careful here because I'm not going to try to insult every anyone here. 
This is all meant in a good spirit, but let's just look. And I mean, if you look in your heart of hearts, you've all done this. Um, so what happened? So we said, oh, this is a really interesting project. Let's make it happen. So the ophthalmologist, I'm just guessing here, Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, went to, so there's this network where they collect these images in the County of Los Angeles called IPACs. It's actually a statewide thing. So they went to these IPACs people and say, can I have some images? Right, I think, I don't know what the request looked like, but it must've looked something like that. And they said, sure. And various people went to various systems and dumped out a bunch of images, right? And some descriptions of the patients, right? So, okay, I have these images and, and the IT people in these various organizations kind of collected them up. And somebody then took all these things and tried to organize them. So they shoved them into a bunch of standardized directories with standardized file names. You've all done this. Right, and a couple of CSV files which have the extra metadata because the file names were getting too long, right? And maybe you have the name of the file in the in the spreadsheet so you knew how to connect these things together, right? And then because uh, we were very excited, and lots of people doing all kinds of stuff, we basically remixed that and we subset it, we remixed it, and we reorganized it, and we had this training set and that training set, and there's like this proliferation of datas and so on and and, and all over the place. So the question is, so how well did that work? Well, let's look, right? And again, so this is an example. Oops, you weren't supposed to see that there. Ha <laughs> ha. This is an example of one of the spreadsheets that we got, right? And, uh, oh, actually, no, I, uh, no, this is good. This is one of the spreadsheets. So this has some of the metadata. And so again, we have an image. The image came from one of your eyes. It's a picture and it's attached to a patient, right? So this is one of the spreadsheets we got, which has all the additional information, right? That came from this clinical dump of this system, right? And we have it, you know, the initial training, we're not going to use it, but maybe these are confounding factors that will help us do the diagnosis. So we have all this data, right? So here it is. And I'm just going to spend a second at it, but already looking at this, it's a disaster, right? Well, What's going on here? No, control, no, right? Metaform in capital letters, metaform in lowercase letters. This one's got a period. Here we've got multiple medications separated by a comma. Here we've got who knows what this is. There's parentheses and little comments in there, right? Look at this, right? More than 20 years, one year or less, you know, nulls, missing, here's we got missing values for identifiers. Right, just looking at this data, it's already a train wreck. This happens all the time. This is typical. I don't care how good your clinical system is. If you go to the IT person and say, give me an extract, you're gonna get garbage like this. All right. And then we look here, you know, so then this is the other thing. So this is now supposed to link together the patient to the image. But again, here, if we have, okay, we have image type, what they've actually done is combined an observation number with the image type. So this is left field three, right? We've got multiple identifiers for where it came from. We've got, you know, all these identifiers. We have some personalized information in there we have to deal with. So that's the data that we came from. Okay, so already it looks kind of nasty, right? Now, common practice is to encode metadata in the file name. So what we did is we put the glaucoma and non-glaucoma images in separate directories. And then we're supposed to use a naming connect convention, which is the subject ID, an observation number, an image, whether it's the left or right eye, um, and then the field, and then which, which, which encounter, one, two, or three. There's only three encounters. So that's what it's supposed to be. All right. Well, now we look at actually what's going on. I'm going to hurry up here. So we have all kinds of problems, right? We've got freeform text, the age durations, the booleans are all over. Yes, no, true, false. There's a bucket load of missing data. The way the missing data is represented is all over the map. Null, NA, NAN, unknown, unspecified, just blank, right? We got data from multiple time zones and different date formats, um, right? So how do we start to get wrap our hands around this? 
Well, the first thing we did is rather than look at a spreadsheet with 56 columns in it, is we said, let's try to understand actually what the problem looks like. So the very first thing we did is we sat down with the domain experts and the AI people, and we came up with a data model. Very, very simple. There's lots of attributes and things missing here. But basically what we said is we have a subject, it's going to have between zero and three observations for the subject. We're going to describe this, we're going to describe the observation with a set of well-defined terms. Each observation has some number of images attached. We're going to describe the image with some number of well-defined terms. And then we're going to point to the actual bits, JPEG file, right? So this is the separation. So this is the metadata. This is the actual data, if you will. So that's the very first thing we did. We said, let's not look at 56 columns. Let's look at now these four things. And now we can start to take these 56 columns and slice them, dice them, and put them where they belong. Now this, once we had this clear data model, now we could start to have rational conversations about what the problem we're solving was. And so, for example, Mike likes to point out, one of the questions was, well, we say you have glaucoma. Is that something that the patient has? Is that something that the observation has? Is that something that the image has? What does it even mean to say you have glaucoma, right? And we can have that conversation because now we can point to something, say, does it go there? Yes or no, right? So that changes the nature of the conversation. So now what we did is we could go through, and now that we knew what our target was, we could go through and... Um, build now some specialized scripts to convert the data and make it more regular. I'm going to hurry up here. So let's look at what we have. So, um, so we built a bunch of scripts here that would validate the relationship. And so we went through, let's look, see the files line up. Does everything make sense? Let's clean up all the missing values. So we used a combination of bespoke code in Python to do this cleaning, along with we leveraged some tools called frictionless data that helped us do data validation, understand what we had. We looked through all the file names and made sure those were all correct. We also did something, this seems like a no brainer, but we computed MD5 uh, checksums on all the data just to see if we had duplicates, all right? And lo and behold, what do we find? Well, we found things like, well, there's all kinds of stuff missing, right? So this is, I'm gonna show you this picture. This doesn't have a diagnosis on this image for the right image, right? This one is actually missing an image. Some of the file names, how hard is it to get the file name wrong? Well, apparently we had wrong file names. This was a file name. That doesn't com conform to our convention, right? And we had duplicated files. So just to summarize, right? of our data set that we were doing machine learning on. Now you could argue, well, these are very small numbers. So we had 22,000 suspected glaucoma, 34,000 uh, non-glaucoma, but we had 46 duplicated images. We had six images which are missing designation of which eye they came from. We had two images that were in the file, but not in the CSV. On the not glaucoma case, we had 18 duplicated images from the glaucoma directory, 19 which didn't tell us what eye they were from, one image that didn't have a record in the spreadsheet and three rows without images. So is this a lot or is this a little? I don't know, you tell me. But I wouldn't want to do a diagnosis where I knew for a fact that I had some pollution between where I had some, some data elements where they say you both have and don't have glaucoma, right? So as a starting point, maybe we shouldn't have that because if this isn't right, should I trust anything else? So, we discovered that by, um, by uh, going through, building this custom code, doing analysis of the spreadsheets, linking all the things, cross-validating. These two folks here spent literally weeks doing this, right? So we ingested the data, we generated clean CSVs, image directories, we eliminated all the duplicates, we normalized all the names, and then we used Deriva ingest tools to ingest these all into a catalog, Right, and now we're gonna use the catalog for our ML development. So let's see what that actually looks like. Okay, now for the, um, now for the, uh, the demo part of the day, I'm going to um, do this. All right, so let's look and see what we have here. So now, what we've done is, so now what we're looking at is the derivative catalog where we've ingested the data. Now, since we have all our metadata, now what we can do is, now we can go very nicely through our model, right? Oops, so, oh, here's the first thing. Here's the A part. 
a uh, timed out. So we have to authenticate to the system. So I've authenticated in this case using my USC credentials. And so now what we've got is a list of all the subjects. Each subject is given its own unique citable identifier, which we call a record ID. Um, and now we've got all the act characteristics. So we can now, for example, um, uh, these are um, various attributes which we have associated with each subject. So for example, is this subject insulin dependent? So now we've got all the insulin dependent subjects. So from subject, I'm not gonna go in great detail here, but we can go to observation. There are three observations per subject. So each one of these is an observation. We can look at this and, the, and then this gives us a set of image pairs. These are left and right eye. And then we can go look at this. So here's the left eye and this has got the diagnosis. So we can go and we can edit all this stuff. So anyway, think about photo album for this machine learning experiment for glaucoma, right? It's just like you would get with Apple Photo or Google Picasso or whatever, right? Okay, so that's not gonna, in the interest of time, and I'm not gonna go any further than that. So now let's talk about what our daily workflow would look like. So one of the things we've done is now we've taken all these images and all these subjects and all these things. We said, I need a training set because I wanna run my algorithm in here reproducible way. So what we've done here is now we've gone and we've created three uh, data, what we call data sets, right? So this is one of our data sets. Now this is interesting. It's got a bunch of eye images on it. Now let's look at the, we don't need this, get rid of that. So let's look at the fair thing. This data set has a globally unique identifier. So this is a persistent identifier that we can now use to uniquely cite down to the bit every piece of information in this in this uh, collection, right? And this is done um, using, so uh, actually I'll get to this in a moment. So this is a globally unique identifier. Now I wanna do some processes. So that's something we need for FAIR. So we've already seen two things with FAIR. I had to log in, that's the A part, right? Um, I have globally unique identifiers, that's the F part. So now let's do some processing. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. So, this is just for data management, right? So it's just like I have a picture, I wanna export my picture to Photoshop so I can give myself a full head of hair or whatever, right? So let's, let's do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to export and I'm going to hit, now what we're going to do now is create a small description of these N billion images and we're gonna use a, 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 a container format that we developed called BD bags. I'm not gonna go into that. But basically what we've done is we've created this big collection of images. We've come up with a very, very compact description of all the images in that collection. We place that in the cloud and we've minted a new identifier for this thing. And this is an identifier we call a minute. Uh, I'm gonna just copy this thing here. And notice this part is you probably don't know what this is. This is what's called a handle. So this is the exact same technology that's used to implement digital object identifiers. So when you have a paper, you say joy, blah, blah, blah. It uses the exact same platform that we're using here. So I'm just gonna copy this part here, all right? And now, so here's the magic. So now I wanna run my algorithm and I wanna run my algorithm on exactly this data set. So I'm going to go over, oops, and so we've developed, now Shredding has developed, this is a template now in Google Collab, which gives us um, uh, uh, access to TensorFlow and a CPU and a Python environment and all that stuff. All right, so now what I'm gonna do, I'm going to paste this in here before I think about it. And I'm gonna remove the space. So now let's do some machine learning. So the first thing, I'm, this doesn't take so long. So the first thing I'm gonna do is say, yes, run this anyway. So now what I'm doing is I'm downloading kind of all the interface stuff that connects to the Google platform. So this is loading this, which is the um, BD bag, which is the, the container format. Um, this is similar to, uh, there's, uh, um, uh, 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 what do they call them? Uh, crates, the RO crates, if you're familiar with Carol Goebel's work. And so BD bag is like an RO crate. Uh, and now we're installing all the Deriva stuff. So all, that's all the Python libraries. Obviously, you know, you might not want to do that every single time. Okay, that's done. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, log on. Let's see, we're going to log on. This is the A part. We're going to log on to the Deriva platform. 
And I'm already logged in, so that's great. And this is usually something called OAuth, which is a very standard way of doing authentication, right? And now what we're going to do is we're going to use that global identifier to retrieve the collection that describes all of our data sets. And we're gonna do what we call materialize. And all the data is still sitting in the Google platform. What we're gonna do is we're gonna, we just have a description of everything. We're gonna pull all those bits over and stick them in our Python environment. So now we can process them, right? And part of doing this process is we actually validate everything. We do, we do checksums, we do reach, right? So we know we have, to the bit, exactly everything that was in the catalog when we created the collection. Right? We can see that because now if we look in our local data set here, so this is, if we look in here, what we see is two things. One is we see, here's all of our images. There they are, right? And the other thing we see we have is now the metadata which is used to describe all these. This happens to be, you know, one piece. So these are all the attributes, right? And this got pulled out of the catalog and downloaded as well. Okay, so now time for some action. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of look into those CSV files and build a Python dictionary. So we're gonna build a JSON structure, um, which is that, okay, did I do that? Yeah, and we see, so now we've just kind of read in these CSV files, common separated value files, and we have now this kind of list of, now this is in Python, so now we're ready to roll. And now, now we're ready to do the action, which is we're going to, um, so this is kind of cool. We're now gonna to go to GitHub. We're gonna check out a specific version of the machine learning code. I should have restarted this. This is okay, right? So we're going to download it from GitHub. It's all in Python, um, uses TensorFlow. And now we're going to run the ML code on all of the, the data, which is now in our local directory, right? And we know exactly what it is because it corresponds to the identifier, which we downloaded from the catalog. There's no question about what data we have. All right? And okay, it's all good. Oh, and now I'm going to show you the magic happens here. We're gonna go back to, um, hopefully this will work. We're gonna go back to our data set and just to show you. So notice here, right? These are the, um, th this is the diagnosis from the ophthalmologist. Now I'm gonna go back over here. Now we're gonna close the loop. This is what Carol Gogol calls a knowledge turn. We're going to now push the result back into the database, into the, into the catalog. Right, and with any luck at all, hopefully I won't be embarrassed. If we now do a refresh on this, yay, this is the result of the ML, right? So now what we've done is we've tied very concretely a specific code, a specific set of data down to the bit, and a specific set of answers, right? Now we have some science. Now we can argue as to whether this specific set of results is right or wrong, Right, and repeat until we get it right. So that's, so now let me, um, I'm almost out of time here. So let me just show you. So that's now we do this every day, right? Now let me just show you the end game. So here's the end game. I'm gonna have to, this is still early on. So I'm gonna have to switch to a slightly different example, which we did the exact same thing, but a completely different example. So we did a, we did a bunch of, well, this is marginally interesting to this crowd. So we had studied the formation of memory in zebrafish. So we have a, developed a technique where we can look at where the synapses are um, in the ze in a living zebrafish brain. And I'll, I'll, this should be relevant to you because this is based on the synaptic theory of learning and neural networks are based on this, right? So the idea we do back propagation and we modulate the synaptic strength. Well, that's the kind of the foundation of machine learning. So we are actually able to measure what happens in living organisms when you teach them something. In this case, we teach them to be afraid and we have ways of measuring whether they're afraid and it, it, it's, it's kind of complicated. So this is interesting. What we found is that the memories were not encoded by modulation of synaptic strength. They were encoded by actually synapses being taken down in one part of the brain and completely new ones being created in another part of the brain. And we could do that because we could match them up before and after and I mean, all kinds of stuff. But here's the, here's the end game here and why this all matters. 
So if we go through this paper in the Proceeding National Academy of Sciences, here's a figure. This is standard biology stuff, right? Figure with lots of panels. Now, what normally when you go into these journals and you click on the link, you get a goofy PowerPoint slide, right, of the figure. Not here. Here we have a digital object identifier, which we created because we're a data set site, data site site. And if you go to that, I'm going to um, site, I'm going to log in here. Or maybe I won't, maybe I will, good. What you see is not just the figure, but we now have a pointer back to all the data that was behind that figure. So now from here, we can go back and we can track all the experimental data. Oh, come on, show me something in. Right, all the experimental data that went behind generating that figure, right? And here's the actual formation, the synapses before and after learning, right? And we can trace this back to the microscope that generated the data. And we use this to find broken microscopes, right? Because we had all this data, hey, this doesn't look right. All the microscope is broken, right? So that's the end game, right? So that if you do this, you've got continuous for this all along. This happened instantly, right? We did not have to spend six weeks figuring out where our data was and all the student left and which laptop is it on and which directory is it in and what's the name of it. This happened like that. And then when the reviews came back and said, well, could you change this and change that? That took us an afternoon not a week, right? Because we had access to everything. It was just there, all right? So that's the end game. So if we look at this continuous fairness, it not only makes sure you get the, the machine learning right, not only gives you basis for comparison, but then when you wanna share your result with the global community, you're in a much, much better position to do that. So, I'm not too bad. Any questions? It all makes complete and total sense. There's one question in the chat, which is, uh, will we have access to the slides, recordings? I've answered that. But the scripts for data management, is there a link to where they're hosted? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, there's that. So that the there, there's kind of two pieces, right? So there's the bespoke code that we wrote, Hennekin wrote, so we wrote to get the data in, right? So those are probably not reusable. And then there's kind of the, we have the template for the machine learning stuff. That's just a reusable template. Um, and then everything else is sitting on our platform. Um, and all this stuff is open source, so you can see everything. All right, so kind of um, uh, to wrap up, right? So hopefully, I, yes. Yeah, uh, first thing for your talk, uh, my name is Travis. I'm working with Yolanda on uh, like reproducibility um, and automation. And so my question is, um, how do the data, uh, the, the fair data approach uh, and the Reva uh, platform take into account like security of the data as in who all have access. Yeah, so that's so that's a long answer, but so I'll try to answer it quickly. Yep. So what we've done is, so if you look at, um, there's this kind of life cycle, right? So what we do is in the platform itself, and I showed you a little bit of that, right? Which is I had to log in to see things. We can actually control access at the individual cell level. Okay. So what we do is we write policies which describe who gets to see what and when, okay. right? Because in reality, things change over time. So if you look at the Synapse uh, repository, it's got all of our data, not all of it's public, right? So the stuff in the paper is public, the stuff that, you know, we have other stuff that's not public. When you're in review, you have um, embargo you have to deal with. So we have a very robust and flexible way of applying a, a policy, um, literally at the level of you can read and write that cell. Okay. So that's that's how we deal with it. And also we deal with uh, human subject protected data that way as well. Okay. So that's a, a big conversation we can have about that, but, but yes. And then what we do is we, we, we kind of base that on, the, as I showed, well, I didn't show you, but this stuff is all controlled by access through USC um, shibboleth, right? Or you could use Google or you could use uh, ORCID IDs. There's all kinds of ways you can authenticate to the system. Uh, and in the case of uh, the Common Fund Data Ecosystem, we actually do have protected data. And some of the metadata is protected, not just the data. So you have to deal with all that. Um, so let's see. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you good data is essential, right? We need to think about the data first uh, when we go and tackle a machine learning problem. Otherwise, we're just fooling ourselves to think we've made progress. And I think from the early, early examples, right, 
the literature is rife with examples where we've claimed wonderful things and they're actually not so wonderful or they're looking just a little corner case. It's not actually any better, right? So let's do things that are actually better, not things that are just the same. So we can crank out a paper and go to a conference in an exotic location. Um, we need to think about curation, high quality data for model validation and comparison, right? You, if there are errors in your data, you should understand what they are and prove to me they're not important, right? Otherwise, I don't believe a word you said, right? So it's really important. And that the, the thesis here is that this notion of continuous fairness and fair data is a really good starting point. Does it solve all the questions? No, right? Is it still possible to mess up? Yes. Does this address issues like bias and ethical use and all that stuff? No, right? Are there deep statistical questions I might need to answer to look at uh, confounding variables in my data that I didn't see? No, right? But this is just basic data hygiene and we tend not to do this. And at least this is a good starting point. If we don't have this, all the other deep questions in my mind are meaningless. If we don't have just the basic, do I have a training set that doesn't have duplicates from my validation set? That's a really good starting point. Right, so um, I'm not too late. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Onward. And thank you, uh, students, raise your hands again. They did wonderful work over the weekend and getting all this stuff working. So thank you. Thank you very much.